and bring that into the world of preschool policy, into the world of kindergarten, first, second, third grade school settings, into kind of family engagement policies, into what we understand about how home visiting programs for um, first time mothers with infants might be working in, in, in how it's bringing, um, how they might be able to harness technology to help those kinds of programs. And I just want to tell you about a couple of um, initiatives underway. Um, one is the, that there's been a group that's formed called the Alliance for Early Learning in a Digital Age. And it's a combination of a lot of different organizations, including the Outside Prevention Fund, Fred Rogers Center, um, Sesame Workshop, Joan Gantz Kearney Center, um, Erickson Institute, PBS, Sesame, I hope I'm getting everyone. I didn't have the exact list in front of me. But this is a group of really that of thoughtful people who are trying to grapple with this issue of how media fits into early learning in the digital age. And I think over the next few years, you'll hear more about that group and what they want to do. At the New America, um, at New America, with this, this institute right, come from Washington, D.C., we hosted a research discussion in October to try to distill where some common ground lies among just the research that we know on how children learn best from media, when it's getting in the way of their learning and when it's not. And we're going to be holding an event on March 26th in, in D.C. that will be an open event to try to air some of that and bring in some of the policy implications to that. Um, there's also the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, which is a national movement to bring more attention to the um, really distressing reading scores in this country. It may not be something that everyone in this room is aware of, but um, third and fourth graders are, are really not becoming proficient readers at the rate that they need to. And the national data shows that um, over two-thirds of kids in fourth grade are not reading at grade level. Two-thirds. That's not like divided by income level. It's just of all of our kids in this country, two-thirds. And if you do, if you start looking at it by demographics, um, it gets even more upsetting and distressing, especially for low-income kids and kids of color. So this group, the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, has been taking a lot of different steps to uh, address this in communities at the state level. But one of the interesting things is that they're looking at technology and where media and technology fit into that question of like how do we help children get to that place where they're feeling like they're strong readers and they're excited to pick up a book and read when they're um, in fourth grade. And we at, at New America with the John Yance Community Center are working on a, a multi-year project to try to bring some light to how technology can be used to engage parents in the reading classes with their kids, or just even in conversation and things that um, open up uh, their, their language skills and their kind of understanding of, of what's happening in the world. Um, two other just quick things to note. Um, there's an Institute of Medicine committee that has been formed, um, a National um, Research Council IOM committee, that is looking at what the science of, of kids up to age eight and what the workforce really needs to know. And I'm on that committee, and what was really encouraging to me in the first meeting in December was that the concept of how, you know, where's technology in this? What are kids using? What are they using at home? What does the workforce need to know about the kinds of media children are using at home? That was absolutely in the center of the discussion. And so that will lead to some, some reports later that, that, that will come out um, about a year from now. Um, lastly, and then we can get into our provocateurs, um, we put out a report last, uh, this week at New America called Subprime Learning Early Education in America Since the Great Recession. And it was a look back over the last five years looking at not just preschool but birth through third grade outcomes and policies to see whether we've been making any progress as a country, especially for kids um, in need. And the bottom line is we're really stagnating. Um, the past five years have not been good to, uh, to families and to kids um, in those younger years. And one of the things that we found that really was ignored over the past five years in, in policy was how to harness media and technology to help make a difference. So we're hoping that by spotlighting that that's been ignored for five years, maybe we can turn the tables on that. And there'll be more to come on that soon. Okay. All right, so that's just a sense of people. We are talking about it. That's the good news. 
Um, we're going to break this out into a couple of different topic areas. And one of the things we want to focus on is the data in this report that looks at low-income uh, families and minority families and how they are um, feeling about the media that's in their homes and how they are defining it themselves as educational and why. And, and we, Fabian um, Doucet, who is an associate professor at NYU, could not be here today um, because she's gotten terribly ill. Um, this January has to end, right? <laughs> I mean, it's got to end, like, for, all, for all of us. Like, it's just been tough. Um, so I know that she really would have had some really interesting um, points to make. She focuses on um, low-income families and also um, understands home daycare settings and what they need for low-income families. But we have amazing people in the room who can help speak to this as well. And so I want to call on a couple of them to try to unpack a little bit of what these, these statistics and these data mean to us when it comes to low-income um, and minority youth. So let me first um, ask Vicki Katz if um, she might be able to stand up from her, Vicki, where'd you go? There she is, I'm sorry, okay. Um, and, and just, Vicki, we were talking a, a moment ago, just before this, um, panel got started about some of these maybe uh, puzzling data points in here that are showing that Hispanic um, families, for instance, or Hispanic parents were not seeing that their children were learning as much from different types of, of media as compared to some of the other demographics that were noted. Can you talk a little bit about why you think that might be and any other kind of points related to the, the survey data? Well, thank you for, I'm, I'm sorry that someone was, was ill, but I'm happy to have a chance to talk to everybody. Uh, and happy that I managed to stay healthy for January. But um, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> it's not done yet. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you to Michael and the team at the CUNY Center for this wonderful report and to Vicki for all her hard work. Um, there's so much that's so rich in here. Um, and. I'm looking forward to seeing what um, Vicki calls for at the end of the report, which is a deeper dive into the, um, this almost 700 Latino families and, and digging into uh, their answers to these questions and what's related to what. But um, I've been, I'm a professor at uh, Rutgers in the School of Communication and Information, and I've been looking at low-income uh, Latino families and the roles that technologies play um, in these families for um, almost a decade, and um, looking at how children and parents engage around technology for different kinds of learning, both formal learning related to schools, but mainly informal learning related to social inclusion, civic engagement, um, connecting with resources that the families need, and so forth. And I think that what's provocative in this report for these families is this idea that I've seen very much in the qualitative work I've done in families' homes, which is that media are very much valued as a source of learning, especially about America and about how things work, and as a source of um, English um, resources for learning for parents and for kids. When we ask that same question about learning and define learning in the same way that the CUNY Center and Vicki had in a set of interviews that we did um, in Chula Vista, California this summer with 54 low-income Latino families who were considering broadband and computer adoption, they repeatedly said that television was a major educational resource for them, and it was primarily an educational resource for learning English alongside their kids. So joint media engagement, absolutely a major factor here. Um, and possibly that the learning goals for these families look different from a middle-class white family because their circumstances are different and their learning needs are different. And those may be things we're not completely addressing yet. Um, that they think their kids learn less than other groups from media may have something to do with what media are available to them in Spanish and in English. Um, it may be an access issue of what kinds of technologies they already have available in the home and um, Vicky profiled today what they are less likely to have access to in terms of devices. But the fact that they want more information is a testament to how important these technologies are and that families are very much acutely aware, especially when they have limited levels of education themselves, especially when they don't speak fluent English themselves, they are acutely aware of the resources that they need to help their children succeed in the United States, which 
is the primary reason that most of them are here. Um, and so I'm very excited to um, be working with the folks at the Cooney Center and with partners at the University of Texas with um, very generous funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that we're going to be examining this in greater detail moving forward. Um, going to be looking at low-income Mexican origin families in Arizona, um, in Texas, and in California this year who qualify for national and local initiatives uh, aimed at increasing adoption and inclusion for broadband, for computers, for tablets, and other technologies to see how families make decisions about whether or not to take advantage of these opportunities, what their reasons are for why they do or do not, and how those get included in family media environments that already exist from parents' and kids' perspectives, with the ultimate goal of helping to figure out how to better leverage these technologies for learning in these families and informing policymakers, practitioners, um, and folks at different levels about how we can create policy and practice that really serves these families in ways that perhaps they haven't been optimally served before. And in the second year, we'll be working on a survey, a national survey, which Michael alluded to earlier. So very excited to continue this deep dive into trying to better understand from different methodologies what these families really need and how technology can be better leveraged to assist them. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Let me ask you a, 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 just a follow-up, if I can, on that. Um, there's a, a sense out there, and certainly from some of the data from the Pew Internet Life Study and others, that um, that Latino families use their smart, they have smartphones, they're very high um, adopters and users of mobile. And I wonder if there's anything um, that we need to understand better about how they're using devices um, in, in, to communicate with their family members that also relates to, or maybe doesn't, um, to this question of like whether there's a learning experience for children in the media that's on those devices. Are we seeing, maybe right now, that Latino families are seeing it as a communication device, um, but, but are not finding apps or videos that you know, speak to them in terms of what they're the learning, uh, maybe it's, whether it's not learning of English, but learning the kind of content that, that they relate to them, to their kids. I think there's an important distinction here between access as kind of a yes or no, do you have access to certain devices and technologies, and issues of meaningful inclusion, right? In the content and the things that are available through that device, you know, recently it released data that African Americans and Latinos use um, mobile banking much more than other groups do. Part of the reason for that is that, that if that's the only way that you have access to the internet, then you use your mobile device for banking. People who have access to perhaps a wider range of devices would rather do that if they're going to on a computer because it's easier to log in anyone who's ever tried to fill out an application or log into anything that's going to require a lot of input on a smartphone probably gave up in disgust and might have thrown it against the wall. But if that's the only device you have to do that, then that's what you use. And one of the things that was interesting amongst these families in Chula Vista this summer is that even when a new computer has come home from the school that is kind of the school computer, first of all, parents consider that the computer for school, so they don't use it for their own needs. Um, but they continue to use their smartphones because they're used to using them. There's a path dependency sort of issue the same way that, you know, if you've used a Mac, you continue to buy Mac unless you have a reason to change. It takes more effort to move out of that realm. So the fact that low-income families are using mobile devices more than other things may not be because of a state of a real preference as much as that that's what they're used to, it's what they're comfortable with, and because they haven't had much access to a broader range of technologies. We don't know that for sure, but the presumption is, you know, these technologies are used the way that the rest of us use them. And part of the reason that TV remains so dominant in Spanish um, dominant families is because you can engage around the TV together. And it's much harder to engage around the smartphone and do something together than it is to do that around television. But the, in, in many families, those are the two primary ways that right. people connect right. with content. So thank you. A lot more to learn. Let me also um, call on Kevin Clark, who is also being put on the spot here um, this morning. But yeah. Kevin, um, 
It was at George Mason University and has been for many years looking at issues of um, family diversity and its intersection with the development of um, educational um, software, games, technology, um, broadly defined. So Kevin, first, was there something that stood out for you as you looked at the data in this survey, uh, or the survey results, and, um, and let me just go ahead and ask him the question that I think is on a lot of our minds that many of us, many of you could also probably answer or, or speculate on, which is I'm wondering what, what's behind some of the differences um, demographically in a parent's perception of whether the media that they're using is educational or not. Um, well, I think part of it is trust, and that is, you know, when you put on PBS, you trust that it's educational. And the other, the other component is the type of media. I mean, we know that um, particularly African American families um, consume more uh, media or TV content. And so, if that's the case, and some of that content is linked to sources that are presumed to be educational, then you may see a, a rise in the amount of content consumed in a home that is seen as educational. But even with, even with that, that's, that's a guess. Um, and based on a lot of the conversations here today, I think what we really need to, to begin to do, and I think Vicki and some others have mentioned this, is to really look at the learning ecosystems that exist inside the homes. How many devices you know, are present? Who uses those, those devices? Uh, Vicki mentioned that you know, this computer in the corner may be deemed as the school computer. So if I'm asked about educational content on that machine, I may think, Every time a kid is on that machine, it's education. Well, it may not be. So I think um, looking at the ecosystem and, and taking uh, demographics into account, we can't discount you know, notions of income, education of the parent. Um, is, is one of the parents taking a class at a, at a university, which may require them to use a computer, which means that now they're talking about what's, what's happening um, or could happen through the use of the computer. So I think there needs to be, as in most educational research, more study. Um, <laughs> but I did want to highlight a, a, a couple of things that, um, that got me thinking. And that is, when you talk about um, consumption of content, what does that mean? Uh, what, what are the, what's happening? Uh, are they just consuming it? Or are they producing? Are they learning something? Are they innovating? What's happening as that content is being um, consumed? So again, I think that would be a useful, um, a useful e examination, or would require a useful examination. Um, also, this whole notion of transmedia, and I must admit, every time I say the word, I'm like, why did I make up that word? <laughs> um, but when you talk about transmedia, um, we need to look at the trans. Right? We spend a lot of time talking about mobile and TV. And you know, one of the things that will that stick with me about what Melina said, in addition to um, how long the cockroach lives when his head is cut off, is this whole notion of looking at the magazine as a way to get students interested in content. And so I think we, we kind of forget about print sometimes. And, and when you look at media consumption, and then you look at achievement, it's hard to make a correlation. But when you look at reading level, and you look at achievement, you, you can see a correlation. And so I think that's um, an area sometimes where particularly African American and, and, and low income families um, are, aren't investigated enough. How many books are in the home? How much time is spent reading? Um, the snow days gave me time to evaluate my learning ecosystem. Right? <laughs> and so what I noticed is that left to their own devices, my children would be on the computer or watching TV for three straight days. <laughs> I had to say, read a book, read the New York Times, read the Washington Post, read a paper, and then find something online that connects to that. So this whole notion of learning across media formats, I think we need to, to, to focus um, on. 
and, and I'll sit down, this whole notion of co-creation, right? Um, and not co-creation in terms of, I'm going to go to, to your house and we're going to build something, but co-creation in terms of being informed by community. So co meaning community, and then being informed by those communities, right? So, um, you know, Roberto Joseph, who is a friend of mine, um, has one of the best, best math apps I think is out um, called Circuit Math. And this next one is based on um, a game called Skellies. How many people know what Skellies is? All the old people from New York, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And so when you look at that game, it brings with it the culture of playing a game on the street. And so that game will immediately connect with people from that community, right? Lisa Moses Johnson, who has a math um, product called Moses Mac, similarly, if you want to create a product about girls and science, talk to a young lady who has been successful in science and work with her to help you build it. And so beginning to co-create, meaning community-informed creation, I think, could be a way to increase African American and um, Latino involvement. And then Sita from Common Sense Media also talked about this whole notion of, of broadening who is reviewing this stuff and, say, and putting out the stamp of approval on it, right? So that maybe once we see some people uh, rate some stuff high, they might look at the reviews and say, well, wait a minute, I didn't think about it that way. So maybe they'll change their ratings or they'll uh, be implicitly educated about how to review educational content. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I think it's time for me to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Um, so the, the, the snow day issue has been on my mind this morning as well. Um, so I've got a 9 and 11 year old been home for a very long time. I got back this with it. And, um, and I, I've been trying to think about it, though, in terms of the digital divide, in terms of what we know about um, inequitable access to resources at home as well as at school. And um, I guess I'll just kind of throw out there um, some things that have come to mind, in part because of the, one of the questions asked in this survey was, you know, were your children prompted to ask you a question based on what they experienced with their media? Were they prompted to then want to go do an activity? And uh, so anybody who has um, nine-year-old girls knows that Rainbow Moon is part of your life, and so is duct tape. Duct tape purses, duct tape creations. And the reason that this is happening so much in my household is because there are YouTube videos that can be watched ad nauseum during snow days about how to use duct tape to create really cool purses and belts and butt. And this is great, except if you don't have duct tape at home. It's not so good then, because then they just keep watching and they keep watching and they keep watching and they never actually go and make anything. And, um, and I think about what David Kleeman had brought up earlier about these wonderful examples from other countries where children get to see other children being creators and then go out and build the forts or take apart the, you know, the washing machine. Do our kids, and is this something that is an income issue, you know, an income disparity issue, do our kids have the resources at their disposal or the time or the safe places at their disposal to go and do something that they've been inspired to do because of what they saw in the, in the media. And I, I think that that may need to be kind of a new layer to our discussion about what learning children are getting out of these media experiences to recognize that does transfer into the offline world in some way. And we haven't really ever been able to kind of pick up on whether kids can in fact do that. Um, and I gotta say, duct tape is not cheap. Actually, um, for the really cool color duct, duct tape, you know, like four or five bucks a roll, and then you're done in a day. Uh, okay, so let me um, move on to um, another point that we want to kind of raise from this, and then I want to open it up to discussion. The the joint media engagement issue came up in this in this study, and it's certainly coming up, you know, in Kevin's remarks and Vicky's around how families are you might be using media together and seeing it. Um, differently depending on their kind of the cultural lens and their needs. And um, 
I, I wanted to call on Lori uh, Takichi from from uh, Pyongyang's community to talk a little bit about what. Um, so tell us, Lori, what you think some of the findings around joint engagement, parents and kids together using media, what they tell us. Were you finding them encouraging, um, or is there some some work to do there? I actually there. Um, there were two points in particular that Vicki um, didn't share from in her presentation that I kind of want to pull out and just to um, let you guys, or see if you guys think this is in, as interesting as I do. One of them is, um, okay, so Vicki talked about how the proportion of time that parents spend in joint meeting engagement does not vary based on the family's risk, income, or parent educational level, which you mentioned. The one exception occurs with mobile devices. Hispanic Latino families spend 43% of their children's mobile media time in joint engagement, compared to 25% for white parents and 21% for blacks. So the question is why? Um, about a year ago, I think, I had a conversation with Jeanette Bettencourt, who had done, uh, who is um, um, EVP of uh, Outreach at Sesame Workshop. And I think, Jeanette, correct me if you're wrong, you ran a focus group with Latino um, mothers um, about their cell phones and how they were their lifelines. Yeah, yeah. Did you want to just say a little bit about, about that? That was actually a, a spontaneous focus group um, that you know, <laughs> happened in research. Uh, what happened was that I was uh, actually doing um, a presentation offering information around our food insecurity effort, hunger, uh, and the tools that we have. And this was actually for a homeless shelter for young mothers and their children. And as we were, again, exchanging information about food resources and healthy habits and a limited income, I noticed that many were on their cell phones. And I'm thinking, this is a bit of a disparity. Here's a homeless shelter. And I, at the end, I, I just I said, I, I just want to share a little bit, if I can ask you a couple of questions. And I asked them to tell me about their actual mobile device. And when here, they, they started saying to me, this is my lifeline. This is where I have everything. This is not an educational device, it's a lifeline device. I have my WIC vouchers, I have my bus schedule, I have everything. And I said, how do you engage with your child at times with that phone or that mobile device? And they said, well, if I'm standing online and we're waiting some time, I'll offer it, but I'm very careful because it, I'm always afraid that certain, not only time will be used, but things will disappear, change that are vital. So it was the vitalness of that device. And I, I also asked, how do you maintain this in terms of income? And, and they described many, many creative ways where they would go to sometime community fairs and be able to exchange their plan and get a new plan that's actually longer. So there was a lot of turnover also. And what struck me was the, the idea of a lifeline of a mobile device. So that was the experience. Right. So, so that thank just, you. Is, no, thank you, Jeanette. Thank so the reason why I asked Jeanette to talk about that, she didn't know I didn't ask her, um, was that um, just thinking about you know Latino parents are spending 43% of, um, of the time co-using mobile devices. It's because it's their lifelines. It's what they're spending a lot of time on. And so just thinking about how these devices provide opportunities for parents and kids to have interactions, it's more likely that they'll, these parents will interact around a mobile device where the parents are spending a lot of time on that device as opposed to a video game console, where, which may not be as appealing to parents. So um, one thing that I want to mention, so there, there's another report that we released about two years ago now, I guess, called The New Co-Viewing, and it's all about joint media engagement. And in that report, we sort of, one big um, point that we like to raise is that in order for um, media to really, in order to bring parents and kids around media, the media needs to be engaging for both people. It can't just be like kid stuff because parents don't, they don't wanna look at kid stuff all the time. It's just hard. So um, so that's just a point that we need to, to think about. It's just, and I think it relates to the, the Latino mothers um, anecdote is that, you know, it needs to be something that both um, parties are interested in. Um, Another interesting point out of the survey that I'll have you also look at on page 29, um, related to Jamie, um, 
I want us to think about not just parents in joint siblings are very important. I think uh, Vicki mentions uh, that, or report mentions, that um, children actually use media with their siblings most often, and then their parents, and then to some degree grandparents. So let's also think about grandparents, especially today, when um, so many families are extended. There are uh, many more families today living with grandparents and cousins and, and just larger family situations. So, so this point on uh, page 29 is that um, black children, those from lower income families, and children whose parents did not attend college are more likely um, than other children to co-engage with media with their grandparents. However, Hispanic Latino children um, are less likely than white or black children to do so even though multi-generational families, which is um, ones in which at least two generations of adults live under the same roof, are more likely among Hispanic Latinos than they are among blacks or whites. Um, so, so it's kind of weird that you know, we know that Hispanic families are, that they're bigger families living under the same roof, but there's less JME. And the only thing that I can you know, guess is that there may be issues around just language, right? So Hispanic grandparents may only speak Spanish, and their children may only speak English and I, and I realize that that's, sorry, is that that's um, an issue, right? It's just, um, uh, and, a, and a desire, you know, grandparents do want to interact with their children on media. Um, it's not because they don't want to have anything to do with technology, but there may be an issue around language. So I think that's all I want to Yeah, thank you. So let me also see, yes, thank you. Um, Shelly Pasnick, I can't find you. I think you're here somewhere. Um, around. This, this question of joint engagement at, at EDC, and for those of you who don't know, Shelley, um, she's directing a, a, a range of research projects, many that are funded by the Ready to Learn, NSF, and others, to really kind of investigate where there's effective um, use of media <laughs> and technology actually happening in learning settings and at home. Um, and, and Shelley, if you could just talk a little bit about what, if, if there's some things you may have found around joint uh, engagement? Um, yeah, yeah um, you know, we've all been together for such a long time, I feel like I can uh, I can be different people in this group. Uh, <laughs> uh, so part of what uh, we've been looking at in the context of Ready to Learn has me conjuring Sandy Calvert's work and uh, also some of what Ellen's been looking at, the parasocial relationship. Can you keep this a little louder? Is this one not working? Oh, it's not working? Okay. Hey, this, yes. 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 All right, so I'll start a little, I'll start it. Um, so uh, in the context of Ready to Learn, we were asked to look at um, the educational potential of different transmedia, and this is something that Kevin was referring to. And when you think about transmedia, it's not just moving across platforms, but it's also the relationships that young people and adults can have with the characters and how you embody a story. Um, and that's, that's one piece, I think, to call out, to think about how we stay within an imagined, imaginary world or maybe even a, a, a factual world across those media. Um, and also, um, when we look at um, how we're going to feel the study, um, we're thinking about not only those affordances, so thinking about transmedia, thinking about um, how to enrich the relationships that young people and adults have with one another. And so before fielding the study that we did looking at the potential to learn math um, in the way that we did in this last study, we did a context study um, that had us looking at what is actually happening in the homes. And I think it's, an, it's a nice com um, uh, uh, complement to this study because when I was looking at many of the findings, I think, but I want to know more. But I want to know more. And in the context studies, what we did is we actually went into homes and talked to families and looked at how they are using media. And it's hard because you, you know, you're you're pushed between or you're pulled between the, looking at the statistics, you know. And I think this this report uses a lot of numbers and then getting very specific. But I think if we're going to move beyond assumptions and we do a lot of projecting, you know, I think assumptions uh, work against us. Then we need to get into the particulars. And there we found that in many homes, um, especially those in underserved communities, media is used um, as entertainment. Um, it is used as, um, Vicki was describing, as a way of 
understanding the dominant culture. Um, and so how media can be a part of the enculturation process. And that it's a more affluent assumption um, that we bring as middle class people, or as more affluent, or as more resource people, um, to seek out information and to seek out education. That, that that tends to be a cultural difference or an economic difference. Um, so being able to look at the vignettes that we were able to do in these context studies, I think, creates more of a, um, gives us some color to the fabric. Um, and, you know, I mean, this is probably self-interested, um, a call for more research, maybe, you know, Kevin made this call as well, um, that we need to get beyond the numbers. You know, we need more numbers and then we need more portraits that give us real um, illustrations of what those numbers convey. Are those um, context studies available to folks? Is that something that one can come find on your? They website? are. So that's the that's the nifty thing about Ready to Learn. It's taxpayer supported. So this you know this is hopefully a responsible use of your dollars. <laughs> um, um, so it is work that you can find not only on our site, which is the Center for Children and Technology. But I think you're going to have an easier time if you go to the PBS Kids Lab, um, because PBS is also committed to making this research available. Um, and as I pointed out with the group of us that we gathered for Ready to Learn last week. Um, there's something there for every attention span. So if you want to hit the highlights, you can hit the highlights. If you want to look at the executive summary, you can do that. And if you really want to dig into some of the details, um, then look at those, those little reports. Thank you. Lori, did you just want to say something real quick? And then I, wanna, I know there's a lot of folks who want to um, make some comments. Very quick. So um, along the lines of Shep, what Shep is doing, so this survey that we just administered, we are actually um, going to be fielding, or actually we are right now fielding, um, smaller ethnographic studies um, in New York City, um, Arizona, San Francisco, and uh, Chicago, where we're actually uh, study fam going into homes and actually observing families use media together. Um, and for each of the families that we study, we're having them take the same survey um, that is presented here in this report so that we can um, not just share with you, you know, what's going on in this particular family in great detail, but also be able to contextualize that family within the broader picture that um, that Vicki has just created with this report. So, so keep your eye out for that report. Which we have to have up soon too. That's great. So I saw a hand over here, and yes, if you want to head in, um, introduce yourself, of course. Hi, um, I'm Pam Johnson, and I work. Um, with uh, the Ready to Learn initiative at CTB and partners with PBS and many people in this room. And a big part of um, Ready to Learn is, you know, to be accountable to having, uh, to illustrating the role that media can play in helping children to learn. Um, we, we actually do have to prove some outcomes. And one of the, um, you know, we're lucky, we're really lucky to have Shelley and EDC and SRI as summative researchers. We also have uh, the group WestEd and uh, their team working on formative and some uh, early um, quasi-experimental studies. And I think between the two kinds of work that we're doing with research, we're able to create promising models. And one of the um, recent studies and, um, that WestEd has done has been a home study where they have um, gone into spend time with um, about 120 parent and child uh, dyads. And in that relationship, they've established a, a, a model that I think has promised for family engagement. But it, but it also illustrates um, a, a lot of uh, great determination needed to kind of pursue it because it, um, it creates a 10-week experience. That is light involvement, light mediation, you know, having fun, be there for the families and the kids. But the parents are actually coming to uh, a, a meeting every week, a little dinner meeting, and for 10 weeks. And um, a teacher from the Head Start is being trained to be a facilitator to introduce to those families the media, the trans media that's been built by PBS Kids. So gaming suites around Cat in the Hat or Curious George or uh, Dinosaur Train, those gaming street the suites are part of um, an exposure experience that the parents are having. It's fun. They're talking about the games. They've been given um, a, a, a very moderately priced, easy to use um, Chromebook. On it is all the material they need. And so uh, over time, they're having this wonderful experience. And what we're, they're being asked to do 
is every week when they go home, try to find four times in that week uh, when they can do some things. And they're given a, a light, loose set of things to do, some ideas to pursue that are all skill coordinated. And um, what we found in this work is really very neat because the children, especially the three-year-old, all children in the official intervention had uh, gains. The three-year-olds had significant gains in their math skills. And then what was fascinating, I, you know, as fascinating as the children's gains were the fact that families themselves, the parents, had significant gains in their own sense of um, what math was for their children, in their own sense of the role they could play in, in casually fun at home with the, with the devices and with the games. And so really what it, what it offers us all is a form of, a, it's a model, it's a family engagement model. But it's not really for the faint of heart model. It, it's a model that would need um, you know, a lot of um, advocates on the ground. And so I think you know partners, local public stations who do outreach work with families, other partners on the ground working with preschool uh, families, it's, it's a wonderful model. And we're going to be asking West Ed over several years to keep iterating on their home study. And I should say, the home study in um, California, 70% of the families were uh, Hispanic. And their response was just uh, overwhelming. Now, there, there are incentives. I would not be truthful if I weren't saying, you know, they get to use a Chromebook, they get a dinner every week, uh, they have a little incentive that's yeah. paid to yeah. them, so I've got to be honest about that. But they came every week, no one dropped out of the study, 120 families. And mm. I think it's a fabulous, um, it's a fabulous model. It's a, it's a wonderful model. And Shelly, with teachers doing similar things in preschools, creating wonderful, uh, interventions for the study, but the interventions leave us a legacy for uh, models of how to really introduce people to the content. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the dyads are very interesting. The high touch, um, and we heard that earlier from the, the parent teacher association to uh, tech committee to assist um, <coughs> bringing that the high touch may be really necessary. Let's see, let me go to Warren and one here, and then I'm actually going to move to um, another topic, but we can keep the conversation going um, as well. But Warren, do you have a microphone? Uh, so one of the things that questions that, that I mentioned Vicki uh, about was the need for ethnographic, uh, thick description regarding this stuff. Um, and I'm so, so it's great to hear that you're working on this uh, pipeline. And uh, because I think, uh, so about six years ago, I worked with the um, Consumers Union to, and I did a study with 10, fam or 10 or 15 families. And I gave them a dinner if they'd fill up a camera, uh, one tape, 60 minute tape, with footage of what happened when kids were using screens. And it was a, most, a very small sample, statistically horrible. However, it opened my eyes to a question that I hope we address, and that is, and I'm, I'm asking this, Vicki, if you may have kind of come across this, that I had had a feeling when I watched all the all this footage that lower-income kids um, are bounced around from commercial thing to commercial thing, and I think there might be a great inequity that's going on between in, uh, related to income. The kids who have iPads or higher level devices and also have an iTunes gift card uh, are going to be downloading paid content, whereas lower income kids are doing all this free stuff, free trials. They're looking at more advertising. And they're exposed to advertising, which could be related to all these other things. So I think that this is really critical. And I think we should, uh, we should uh, have a closer look at that. I think I'm wondering if you guys will come up with that. But that's something that just jumped at me is that there's this whole economic strata that's getting that's on the low end of the food chain the digital food chain and it's not healthy uh, and the rip the, the more economically enabled kids are getting the touch press the coca bocas the things that cost 99 cents to, to 99. Yeah, um, can, you, can you just comment on, on whether was there a maybe i i'm missed it here was there a moment in this study where there was a, a a question about whether you pay for no. apps? No, we didn't ask about paying for apps, and um, it's something that's come up that um, 
Yeah. Um, but I really want to keep the spotlight on most underserved kids because it is so easy, as I feel like I'll be provocative here, I feel like we're doing today again, of focusing on the most advantaged kids, the kids who have the best technology, the best content for that technology, the kids who don't need to worry about the curriculum and the reading because they're at grade level, they're not with the low and the minority kids who can't even read. And we're sitting here saying, well, let's just teach them digital literacy. I mean, there's kids who need what we provide through educational media. They need educational media to teach them to read because they lack the resources in the home for that. And so the content needs to be available to them. It needs to be free. They don't need to be makers necessarily. They may not be the kids who are the makers. You know, and they may not have the parents who are sitting there using it with them. So I think that there is this role for uh, media for the most advantaged kids that is different than the need that is out there in the broader population. And I just want to, I just think it's great to be honest. Yeah. that. I just need some responses, but yes, yes, please, Edith, and then I want to. I, mean, I, to I just need to vent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> An old Piagetian, and we have to understand that there is a paradox in it all. And the paradox is that if we ourselves as educators continue to have, and I put words here, a concern, fear driven attitude, looking only at outcomes, always describing the so-called low economic uh, strata of the population as a, with a deficiency model. We now started finally hearing about studies where you begin to look at all the richnesses that go on in this family, to look in the details, and for a little moment, just to abandon our own labels. So I just want to mention four labels that should go in the garbage can during the discussion. The first one has to do with delivering contents only. Of course we want the children to learn. The big paradox on which the inequalities continue to live is to say that maybe the ones that can afford it should be makers and constructing their own knowledge, but the other ones let them deliver the contents. This is just reproducing exactly the same. Another one has to do with thinking about uh, working with media as screen time. We have to think about new media ecologies. We have to think about new genres of engagement in, in, in young children. And I'm sorry to use the tacky word, maybe care, and also look at the intelligence. When people talk about a phone as a life, if that is not learning, what is learning? I mean, I'm sorry to vent, but I, I just would like us to uh, just rethink some of the filters through it through which we look, and this is the only reason why I prefer, for the moment, ethnographic studies and context studies, because at least we can really be careful about our own filters. So but, but, but I just really do think that being able to read is critically of course important. They and we can't it. say that we don't want to recognize that lower income kids or minority kids are reading at lower rates because we don't want to impose our assumptions that reading is important on them. I mean, it's important. And uh, the people I who think teach the younger children to read are the ones who have a different philosophy about how you teach children to read. Uh -huh. And the 100 languages of children, for example, is a good example when we talk about new technology. Yeah, so this is such an interesting, I mean, there's a lot here. So much, I'm dying, right, to like jump in. I think that we, we just need to recognize um, the statistics I mentioned at the beginning um, in terms of our you know, reading scores and, and recognize what our country is not able to be doing, they're not doing well right now for, for low income kids, and recognize the incredible richness and possibility of making and creating in that constructivist education world. So I'm going to mo move for one moment now to, and I think we should continue that conversation, absolutely, and I'm going to move for one moment now to try to, to bring out 
the home and school connection between some of this, and I think that that's also where some of the um, implications for children who don't have the same resources at home can come. And I want to bring up um, Robert Torres from the Gates Foundation, who is a senior program officer for Gates, who has been exploring um, the question of the educational technologies used in school and how it connects to homes um, and can be of, of use in bridging that divide. So we'll just take a minute here, and Robert, do you mind, do you want to come up sure. here to speak for a few minutes? And, yeah. um, and yes, we can keep the, uh, keep the conversation going. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, so, gosh, um, what an amazing conversation today. And I wanted to say congratulations to Joe Gascuni Center and to, and to Vicki. Um, as a, I work in a complex place where, um, I mean, it's in a very exciting place, but we are huge. There's 1,400 of me. Um, and unlike a, a typical foundation, we'll have three you know, program officers and one division. I have a team of 120. Um, and so we make grants through debate, right? And we um, and we argue, and uh, and it's great. It's really peer a peer culture. And but I have to say, the Joan Gascuni Center makes my life really easy. <laughs> like you guys just make it with reports like these. It's just you know the evidence of your work is constant and awesome. So congratulations, um, and Vicky, thank you so much for wanting to keep the spotlight on. Um, the kids who are, are, are hardest to reach. I appreciate this debate. The 100 languages of children, the Reggio Emilia model is awesome. We have lots to learn there. Um, but we have an issue. Kids are dying in schools, They're literally dying, right? Um, and unless we do something, I mean, I, I in my career have seen um, maybe a thousand classrooms that I've been in. Um, and, um, and I could have stayed in, in being a school reformer and be happily ever middle class and be part of the multi-billion dollar um, reform industry, but I didn't. I went to see if video games can say, do something um, for our kids since 97% of our kids are playing. Um, so, ooh, I'm out of power. <laughs> Um, okay, okay, I'll be quick. Um, so just, uh, I, have to, I have to throw out one quote by uh, Marshall McLuhan, just because it's so appropriate to this um, fun versus um, learning thing, which is ridiculous. Anyway, so, uh, so it, it, I love this quote. Uh, anyone who thinks there is a difference between education and entertainment doesn't know the first thing about either. <laughs> Um, and you know, and if you look then to research in learning sciences and um, and, uh, um, and and cognitive science, um, we know that the that deep mastery sits at that intersection of high uh, engagement and high cognitive demand. We just know that, right? Um, and so, you know, um, part of my work has been part of the work that I fund is asking ourselves how do we make. Um, uh, learning chemistry and algebra as addictive, yes, addictive, um, as um, uh, Call of Duty, right? Uh, and that is, I think, for us in this room, the greatest design challenge. I think that is what we're up for, is solving for that. Like, how do we create those conditions? So we know that we kind of game like folded creates those conditions, and then kids do the remarkable, I'm not gonna get into folding. But if you don't know what I'm referring to, with 15 kids solving major scientific problems, definitely look up both. Um, I just want to make a quick point. I'm supposed to talk about pathways and the Home Bridge Convention, and I'm going to get there, I promise. Um, so um, just some stuff about just market data. So we as a foundation are unusual in that we look to incentivize markets. Um, so we don't make single point solution grants, like fund the big project we have. Um, before, and I used to, but we, now we look to say there is a dearth of products in literacy in, in, a, in, a, in a market, so we throw money there, so we'll create competitions. Um, and so we have done 
product scans in literacy and and and, and uh, high quality products in the older grades. They just don't exist. They just don't. They really don't. They, they, if we look at the top apps in iTunes and Android, they are the best sellers are for the um, in the lowest um, for, for the youngest kids. So that's that's that just is that just aren't there. Um, on pathways, um, and, I'll, and, I, and I promise I'll be done just now. You know, we gave to Bill Gates a, a five-page paper um, uh, in May about um, this notion of how do we do the home, uh, how do we bridge this home school um, uh, connection, and um, which, um, if you think of yourself as a kid, that those separations are ridiculous, right? That there is like for a kid as a kid. Um, and, and we should try to create a seamless life for them. So we came up with the notion, and I'll, I won't get into the details. I can share the five-pager um, vision paper um, with everyone. Um, for It's a vision for personalized learning. Um, and essentially, it's a learning map that has the metaphor of a tree. Um, and what we want to do is visualize for kids um, um, create visualizations, especially for the neediest kids, um, what it means uh, to master, when you master a competency in the eighth grade, something, it, you know, will light up in that trunk of the tree. Um, but more importantly, um, uh, possible futures will also light up so that there is um, a sense of relevance um, and significance um, that will hopefully engender some persistence. That's a big issue for our kids. They don't see why school is relevant to them. Um, and so, so that those branches are careers. So that we really should think about, real, and technology allows us to really think about the K-16 continuum. There's no reason for us to do that, and we can create the assets that populate those pathways, um, um, the K-16. through <coughs> Many here who would like to see that page. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to get yes, it. Yes, that sounds yeah. fantastic. Um, We're also putting out an RFP for that learning map in a few months. So great. At all. Um, so what I think I might here, do. He said that he's going to be giving out dollars. <laughs> 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 so, I need to hear that. Thank you. Um, so you know what I think I might do because I think that so that that just raises some some issues around just philanthropy and policy and schools and home and maybe. I, if I could, Dale, ask you to then just follow and come up and talk a bit about policies and where we are today, and whether they're, are, are they shaped in a way that helps us with some of these debates we're having here? Are we able to make a difference for low-income kids with the resources, um, with the media, with the kind of school and, um, and home uh, environments that a lot of low-income families um, are kind of coping with, or is there a need for some change in policy and, and how to do that? And then we'll move into, I think, another kind of very free-flowing discussion until 1230 when we're going to break. So, um, Dale, I should introduce, I'm so sorry, I don't have my, um, I, I will let you introduce yourself. Um, but but um, I'm excited to find you, Dale, for, for years I have um, been calling him on the phone and so, thanks so much. Well, I'm, I'm honored to be called a provocateur away from the poker table. Some of you know, know that. So what are the key findings from this report? Uh, I, I just had so much fun reading this report. Um, and there's so much new and yet so much old or you know, familiar issues for those of us who have been doing these uh, topics for a long time. Um, key finding, as media use goes up, as children age, educational content exposure goes down. So the good news is that by the time a child turns about somewhere between 10 and 12, they've spent up roughly two years of time, that a time frame that's equivalent to two years in school. So that's a big deal. That's a lot of opportunity for informal learning. But the downside is, then, that we have a huge missed opportunity with new media. I was just stunned to look at the slides Vicki put up. It says, overall, here's children's educational media use. 
How much mobile? Oh, three minutes a day. How much uh, video game? Oh, four or five minutes a day. So there's a fair amount, you know, almost an hour a day, of educational television use, really tiny amount of new media use. Stunning shortcomings. So let's stop and think about what do we know from TV that's applicable here? What lessons can we learn? Have we done a good job of using TV as an educational medium? Well, sitting in the lap of Sesame Street, as we are here today, it's easy to say yes. Uh, we are all here because Joan Gans Cooney and Jerry Lesser had a wildly successful idea and plan, and they created Sesame Street. And Sesame Street showed us that we know how to make great educational media. It's engaging, it's effective, so we know how to do this with television. And then, at the same time, if you kind of look at the big picture of things, well, so how well have we done with television as an educational medium away from Sesame Street, beyond Sesame Street, sounds like a title for a book. But you know, how well have, have we done? And the answer is, well, maybe not as well as we would have hoped, maybe not as well as we would have expected and so forth. Um, we know Sesame Street's very effective. There's research that documents it. We know that children who are heavy users of educational media do better in school and better in life, on and on. We know that from research done by lots of people here. We know that from research done by their mentors um, who can't be here. Some of them have passed on and so forth. So we have really good evidence about the cost effectiveness and, and the, the powerful positive impact that we can have from educational media. To be successful with children's educational media, you have to have great content, and you have to have some distribution channel. So what did Sesame Street teach us? Well, it taught us how to do great content. Do we have a Sesame Street channel? Well, uh, that's a digression. Now you know we don't. We have public broadcasting. Public broadcasting has been the primary vehicle over time. And what's happened, if you really stop and think about this from an arm's length perspective, what's happened politically is we have political debates about whether or not we should fund public broadcasting. We don't have political debates about whether or not we should fund children's educational programming. The two get intertwined, probably to the detriment of funding for children's educational programming. I mean, let's face it, when public broadcasting is under attack, you know, there's a threat to their funding, who do they trot out to defend them? You know the answer, <laughs> and it makes you nervous, right? I teased Vicky that I would show the, the video of Romney and Bigford. She said, oh, don't you dig <laughs> So how, I'll get back to my question, how effective have we been with educational television? And the answer is, according to the Federal Communications Commission in 1983, according to the United States Congress in 1990, we have marketplace failure. There weren't adequate economic incentives to drive the, the creation, production, distribution of good educational media. How did we get funding for Sesame Street? Well, it wasn't advertiser support, and if it had been, it might have plot. I don't know, but we didn't want to find out, and there were alternatives you know, that, that drove it nicely. So the marketplace failure that's documented in educational TV, that led to the creation of the Children's Television Act that David Kleeman talked about. And that led to um, the great successful educational shows that everyone knows about. The Flintstones that teach uh, history, <laughs> the Jetsons that teach children about new technology, and my favorite that I have covered in the study of license renewal files, Yogi Bear, which is educational because it teaches kids to, quote, not do stupid things or be ready to face the consequences. So be careful, be careful with this idea that everything is educational because, you know, people will call your bluff on this. <laughs> missed opportunity with children's educational programming? Yeah, absolutely. But yet, yeah, what do the data say? Vicki's got data up here that say it's all educational TV. We've, we're in the face of a bigger missed opportunity with new media. And how are we going to fix it? What are we going to do? I, I don't have the answer. But if I have an inspiration for an answer, it comes from you know, your longtime colleague, 
uh, one of the key architects of Sesame Street for many, many years, um, the late Ed Palmer. So Ed Palmer wrote a book called um, The Crisis of Neglect Television in America's Children. In that, Ed documents with mountains of data the cost effectiveness of children's educational media. And he had the gem of a marvelous idea. And the marvelous idea is, what if we had the government invest a penny a day per child to support the production and distribution of children's educational needs? A penny per day? What do we currently spend on education in this country? We spend, oh, it's some, I, I can't give you the precise number, it's between $55 and $58 a day in school. So let's say it's $58.76 a day. What if we spent $58.77 a day? Where we spend a penny a day per child. And we devoted that, we had the federal government devote that money to children's educational media production and distribution. That would yield a total of about $250 million. Might put them on equal footing with the Gates Foundation. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm really glad to hear this news uh, from the Gates Foundation. But if we could do that, then we could have, hopefully, we could establish some new examples for the new media that could be tantamount to Sesame Street. Because you go back to Vicki's data and you look and you say, how do parents know that something's educational? They can't list the criteria. They don't want to list the criteria. It's like fuzzy logic, which has been applied at the Supreme Court to identify some other things they don't want to have all the criteria for. But they know it when they see it. Parents know Sesame Street is educational. They know it when they see it. And we could do that with new media, where you have some examples that people could point to to then wake the parents up. You say parents aren't attending to the types of content they're buying. Well, if they had some really benchmark examples, then I think it's possible. So my question for the audience and you know, for everyone to discuss them would be, could this work? How would you do it? There is a precedent. There was a National Endowment for Children's Educational Television, but nobody can raise their hand and say they got funding from it here because it only existed for about one year from 1990 to 91, and they gave out about $500. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, there's a precedent. That happened because Senator Inouye was interested. And there's an opportunity right now. I know my time's up. But there's an opportunity because if you're a Washington policy wonk, you know the Congress is talking about rewriting the telecom act. And this would be a perfect vehicle to wrap into the Telecom Act. And I am confident. I, um, yes, you know this very well. And uh, so the, uh, you know, the opportunity is there. There's going to be lots of potential allies. And so I'd encourage people to consider that. And if you want to read more about the idea, I think Michael has posted a little blog entry on his website that I've done. So thanks very much. Yeah, a, there's a provocative idea there as well, certainly, in terms of how to um, do more distribution and creation of the kind of, of, of content that we, we think in this room, based on, and I think this is also where there's going to be more debate, and we think is um, going to be more useful to children and, and their learning. Lisa, Let me ask. You should just acknowledge. Oh, yes, so Justin Rosenthal has arrived from our FCC commissioner, and we're looking forward to hearing your remarks um, at lunch or right after lunch today, so it's a real honor. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think that I would like to get some reaction and, um, and, and ask if, if you could, in, in making some comments either about this larger discussion or... Um, about this this policy idea, um, if you could you know keep keep your comments as as tight as possible and end with perhaps an action that you think that needs to be taken, whether it's something that the developers in this room need to take, whether it's something that Congress needs to take, uh, whether it's something that um, those who are working with families uh, need to take, so that we can start and kick off the discussion for this afternoon as well. So let me please. Um, Hi, I'm Ed Green. I'm the Senior Director of Outreach for the, uh, the Hispanic Information uh, 
Expanding Information Telecommunications Network uh, Radio Learn Project. And uh, we are developing a transmedia uh, pro product, and it's not about the app. It's about all of the things that are there to help promote um, educational and instructional uh, opportunities for young children and those who work on their behalf. And I'll, people want to talk about this and talk a little bit more later. I just wanted to say with respect to some of our pilot sites where we've used uh, professionals around the country, one of which is in Maine. Uh, there's an organization called Comienza in Casa. Some of you may be familiar with Comienza in Casa. It's an organization that works with immigrant families. Many of these families um, uh, are Spanish-speaking families. And the ways in which they've been working with them is very interesting because on the one hand, there are parents who want to be able to take, to care, take care of some of those day-to-day -day issues that I think were mentioned earlier, like paying bills and wanting to know how to get access to things. And other has to do with how they help their children. And so our transmedia pro product, which is focused on English language development, early literacy, and early math, has been part of that. Uh, but the point that I, that I wanted to make was that uh, the libraries and institutions of informal learning who are partnering uh, with groups like this, I think, are very important to pay attention to. So back to the point that Sita made earlier about, the, you know, when we talk about families, we, we, there's a diverse way in which we need to look at that. And some of it has to do with the social economics, some of it has to do with the geographic. So I think that that's very important. And then secondly, with respect to the policy uh, side of things, uh, if in fact there is a way to bring more to the table around what we're trying to achieve here, I would hope that we would actually have access to a pot of money that would be involved in professional learning. Because if, there, if we don't have a workforce that's involved at least on the educational side and, and uh, on the side that has to do with the care and education of young children, we're not going to be able to put uh, uh, the, the foot soldiers out there who work on a day-to-day -day basis with parents to help them understand what they need. So I hope that that's a part of it. Interesting. So tapping libraries and um, engaging the, the workforce. Very interesting. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Lila Leggett, uh, formerly of the Rainbow. <laughs> Right now, Mary Mountain Manhattan College, where I teach uh, future teachers in literacy particularly. But I've been an educator all my life, and I am absolutely, I don't know whether I want to write or to say the following. The test theme industry is bleeding the guts out of schools today. It's a billion dollar industry. That money needs to go somewhere else. <clears throat> High stakes testing. It's a big problem. If that money could be turned around and help Ed Green with his project, for example, we might not even have to wait until we get the money from the ether or the commissioner. Yeah. So it's possible. But I, we're so hung up on how, how do we do home, home and school? Reading Rainbow did it magnificently. We couldn't keep it funded. But we did it magnificently because kids and their parents love to watch and love to get involved in the activities. We need to help our school colleagues, and I'm highly critical of how schools are run. I so am a Piagetian. I believe in multi-intelligence and all of that stuff. But we've got to work together as a community. And you know who else is in that community? The public uh, television station can work together with the school with the parents. That's where we need to go. We need to be on the ground as Pam Johnson so eloquently said. Thank you. Patty um, Miller, I wanted to call on you for a moment, if you could, because I know that um, policy issues are certainly on, on your mind in your new role with the Clinton Foundation supported Too Small to Fail program. And um, I wonder if you might speak for a moment about what your going to be working on there and whether technology is coming into play. Sure. Is this on? Hi, Patty Miller. Um, I just recently uh, joined the Clinton Foundation for the Sesame Workshop, where I was for the last five years. Um, and at the Clinton Foundation, um, I am working on Secretary Clinton's new early childhood initiative, um, which is really looking at how you can help parents and caregivers um, work to improve the health and well-being of kids ages 0 to 5. And for the first year of the initiative, we're working specifically on the word gap. And I know there's a lot of educators in the room, so you're all probably familiar with it, but 
it's really just the fact that the, the kids from low-income families hear so many uh, fewer words than kids from higher-income families. It's a 30 million word gap in terms of the number of words they're hearing. And if you look at a four-year-old from a low-income family, uh, they hear they have a vocabulary of about 500 words. Uh, and if you look at the same child from a high-income family, they know about 1,100 words. And that gap keeps getting bigger over time. You see the kindergarten readiness rates and look at the third-grade reading scores and you know, just the idea of this uh, this gap in uh, vocabulary development and reading levels just getting worse over time. So Secretary Clinton is really interested in engaging parents and caregivers and trying to do a public engagement campaign around educating folks about the importance of talking, of reading to your child, singing, you know, all sorts of things just to encourage vocabulary development, starting at the time a child is born. So. Uh, we are launching this campaign. Um, there's, there's two different pieces to it. One is the idea of um, magnifying attention and then trying to mobilize action. And on the magnifying attention front, we're doing all sorts of things, working with different media companies, both in terms of um, trying to get uh, educate different populations about the importance of, of early talk. Uh, we have a piece that involves the entertainment media industry in terms of storyline incorporation. We're really interested in talking to kids' media companies about this as well. Um, and then we're also going to be working in various communities around the country to try and do a deeper dive in particular cities to see if we can actually do a local engagement campaign um, in cities that will involve community service providers, children's advocates, um, mayors, policymakers. So we're really excited about this initiative, and it's just getting off the ground. So I'd love to talk with you all more about it. The Secretary is really interested in the role of technology and the role innovation can play. I mean, truthfully, we know a lot about uh, the, the research around early uh, brain development, and that research has been around for a while, but she keeps saying, what's the game changer here? You know, what can actually start to move the needle when you think about trying to engage parents? So we're really interested in the idea of technology, whether that's reaching parents by mobile phones, um, thinking about different ways that um, is it an app challenge? What are the different things we could be doing to use technology uh, to educate parents and to get parents and caregivers to be um, to be talking and reading with their kids a lot earlier than they are now? So I um, would love to talk with any of you at the break about this and look forward to working with all of you. Thanks, Daddy. And it just reminds me that there's distinctions, too, when we talk about educational media, all sorts of different categories, but there's the media that models things for parents. And I certainly feel like I've been a recipient of a lot of that, just in watching for something unfold on screen, how much it can make me as a parent think about what I could be doing differently. And then there's the media that's been directed to children, and um, and maybe um, be helping parents sort out and find those kinds of um, materials is, is part of the, the policy challenge as well out there. Let me take just two more, uh, two or three more questions here. I'll take, uh, Cita, you wanted to, to make a comment and then um, if you could at least I'll catch you next. Um, I just wanted to um, piggyback on what several of you were saying about, you know, with the comparisons of television to other other forms of media or talking about transmedia, having read and reviewed so many titles, um, very selective, less than and as is worn, you know, less than five percent of what we read receives our highest rating. I just want to say there are gems out there in mobile and digital media. There's much better models in television. Obviously, we've been at it for a much longer time, and there are excellent you know, gems. Many of you are producers here in the room of those gems. But there are gems in the mobile and digital field. It's just that it's such a much more crowded landscape. I mean, consider that 100,000 apps call themselves educational across the marketplaces. 100,000, and several more that are in puzzles, or information and reference, or Games that you know we're almost at a million apps across the two platforms. How is anyone to make you know sense of that? And so you know, going to curation of sources, whether they're parent-led, whether they're you know expert-led, there are some sources now that are beginning that are independent from the industry that are beginning to make sense of that. So there are. It's not that there aren't. Um, good examples, that there definitely are good examples of all the kinds of things that people are talking about, whether it's content, whether it's about engaging parents, whether it's about getting parents and kids to work together, or, you know, teachers, parents, and kids, etc. Yeah. So, um, sorry. But, yeah, and to Joel's point, the, the 
popular ones may not be the ones that are too exactly. going aiming at the older That's kids necessarily, right. and so parents may not be getting a message that those are out there because they're not rising to the top. The ones with the larger marketing budgets are getting yeah. there. It's an interesting problem, Lisa. Good afternoon, Lisa Kane with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading and also Raising a Reader um, and wearing both hats. Um, I appreciated the reference to um, something called a book, so that was <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I can explain later. Um, on, on, on a lot of this interesting discussion about context, something that I was listening for that I didn't hear yet is the issue, of, this is true for parents and teachers, of, of motivation for not just what they're using and how often, but but why and when. So um, if just, just, and this is not based on research, but just observation in my world in Baltimore and beyond, that um, sometimes it's fair to say technology isn't used as an opportunity for interaction, but actually to stop interaction. And so it's not about getting your child to talk or to explore or to learn, it's to get them to stop talking and get busy. And I just think that's probably an issue across race and class, but it's really important to understand if we're going to unleash the potential of this to, for maximum impact. Mm -hmm. Technology is behavioral management uh, software. It's an interesting element of this. Um, let's see, just for some of you who maybe haven't had a chance to, to speak yet, let me, um, if you could, uh, make a comment. And then I think I'm going to turn it over to Michael to, uh, to close us out here. Yes. Just waiting for a mic. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Okay, my name is Michelle Regan-Chenze, and I'm president of Design for Learning, and I also work uh, at NYU. And I wanted to just reference back to uh, Sita's comment about um, the importance of uh, having uh, robust ways of vetting what's out there. Uh, I conducted the first uh, experimental study of any iPad learning app, and I scoured the literature when I did that, and there was not a single study testing whether any of these educational apps are really leading to learning. And so I'm hoping that more studies have made it out into the field since then. But there's really a need, um, taking contextual variables into consideration, but really an important need to find ways of um, offering evidence to consumers about what's really working so that, um, so that we have an educated consumer base as well that won't just be driven by the largest marketing budgets. Let's, uh, let's thank Lisa Gern. Um, I wanted to, before we, uh, lots of food for thought, and before you actually have some food that is not just for thought, uh, I wanted to ask um, Jeff Livingston, who's the Senior Vice President here at McGraw-Hill, to come up and say a few words of welcome. Um, Jeff's a terrific guy who I'm just getting to know, and who oversees the strategic alliances and a lot of the policy work, I think, that McGraw-Hill does locatively um, in Washington and in the States. Jeff, uh, please, please, please come join us. Thanks. Thank you so much. I am acutely aware that I am standing between you and lunch, so I will be quick. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here on behalf of McGraw-Hill Education. I very often describe McGraw-Hill Education as a 125-year-old ed tech startup. I say that because of the, the huge change in what we do over the last few years. It will surprise some of you to know that we now publish nothing only in print. Everything we do is available in print and in various digital um, formats. And that is what schools are requiring of us. That is where we see the future of learning. And I think it's very important that this group of people should know that. But when I call us a, an ed tech startup, I have to make the distinction between the other ed tech startups that you have heard about. Because we have something that they don't, and it's not just funding. <laughs> it's customers. <laughs> we have to work on behalf of every school in the United States, every teacher in the United States, every school district in the United States, and not just charter schools within driving distance of the primary residence of a technology billionaire. <laughs> it is important. <laughs> it is important for you to remember what we never forget, which is that every student in every context deserves the best that we have to offer. Now on the personal front, 
I will say that 35 years ago, you would have found me in Columbia, South Carolina, looking for the pliers that were necessary to turn our black and white television to Channel 25, South Carolina Educational Television, so I could watch Sesame Street. So I have to take this moment to thank Joan Gans Cooney. I am standing in this place largely due to work that you did and people like you did, and I desperately hope that I am not the last generation of Americans to be born in one social economic class and arrive at a different one uh, later in life. I will take a moment to say that a part of how I was able to move from the, the position in which I was born to the position I enjoy today is that a standardized test identified me as having a greater level of intelligence than my South Carolina teachers believed was possible for an African American in South Carolina. <laughs> standardized test made me qualified for programs that would not otherwise have been available to an African American of my socioeconomic status in South Carolina. Standardized test proved to an admissions committee at Harvard University that I could in fact compete with the best of the best and what they have. So if we do indeed decide to do away with testing, let's at least acknowledge the impact it might have on social mobility among some of us who are, who are born in different circumstances. Now finally, it is my deep pleasure to welcome also Commissioner Rosenquist. I will admit, that as much as I admire the work that you do, it's not likely that you'll ever be my favorite FCC commissioner. <laughs> I say that because my very first crush is now an FCC commissioner. I will give you a hint. I'm a black man from South Carolina. I was 11 and she was 17. And her father wasn't yet in Congress. All of that to say, really though, I am, I am as suggested, I am as suggested in charge of McGraw Hill Education's uh, government relations uh, these days, which means essentially that I am paid to listen to millionaires tell me about their granddaughter's favorite iPad app. But um, <laughs> I often, I often, though, find myself in the position because of our work at McGraw Hill Education and our deep commitment to all of our customers wherever they are reminding people that not every student who deserves the best that we have to offer has two English-speaking parents sitting down, devoting time each week to their education. Not every student that we care about has the same home today that they had yesterday or will have next week. Not every student that we care about is as concerned as some of us who have more means are about things other than simple survival. We are deeply committed at McGraw Hill Education to making the best that we have to offer available to everyone and are committed to partnering with all of you in this room to the extent that you are committed to that as well. Again, it is my joy to welcome you to this facility and to this conference. Please enjoy your lunch, and listen attentively to everything that Commissioner Wilson was <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, lunch is served. Um, we have about 40 minutes, and then we will be hearing from our Commissioner colleague, uh, Jessica Rosen. We're on the board together. Thank you so much for us. This is great. Yeah. Real good. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.